Time for another edition of the Everest Connections. I'm AP Harold. We're joined by a very special guest. Folks, we've talked to bloodstock guys, trainers and owners. They're all very important. But as racing fans, the athlete that's with the four-legged athlete, the human being, is the jockey. It's our first jockey and a very special guest. Many of us are not the best in our own neighborhood at something. I'm not sure if I'm the best in my own household at tying my shoes. Our guest today is a world-class jockey, the 2017 Longines World's Best Jockey, the one and only Hugh Bowman. Hugh, thank you so much for your time. AP, hey, what a fantastic introduction. Thank you. The very, very kind words. But no, it's a pleasure to be on the show and talking to you about the Everest and uh, the upcoming Spring Carnival here in, in Sydney and Australia. Absolutely. We'll, we'll delve into that. But I want to start with a general question that's applicable to people who want to pursue excellence. Hugh, when did you know that you could be great at what you do? Uh, I don't think there was ever a particular time that I thought that. For me, it was just, you know, I dreamed of being a jockey when I was like 10 years old, I guess. And, you know, I was lucky enough to pursue that dream. Once I finished school, I actually left school early to start and just continued, you know, kept being the best that I could be at what I was doing and continued to do that for a period of time, but ultimately uh, for a jockey, you know, it comes down to opportunities and horses. And there's no doubt that my association with some great horses is what has enabled me to, to have the career that I've had. Let's talk about another neat association that you have, and that's with Chris Waller, the fantastic trainer. You guys are a dynamic duo. What makes your partnership so effective? Well, I think, you know, he's a he's the ultimate professional, Chris Waller. He's, uh, you know, he leaves no stone unturned. And I think our our personalities and temperaments complement each other. We're certainly um, very different in in many aspects of the way we do and think about things. But in, in other areas, we're very much the same. And I think we're both very driven. Uh, and I guess, you know, I don't really know the answer at the end of the day but you know we, we get on well we work well together and above all else we have a huge respect for one another and you know there's no doubt that that goes a long way in having a great partnership over a long period of time and Hugh you talk about those complementary skill sets between jockey and trainer it's also important for the two athletes yourself and the horse to get along well to mesh well to to I guess it's it's cliche to say be as one uh, how can you put into words from your perspective as a world-class jockey, how you go about doing that? Well, uh, you know, all horses are different. They're like human beings. So, you know, I don't get on with every horse that I ride and, <laughs> you know, I don't particularly like every horse that I ride, but generally speaking, you know, I, I have an intimate relationship with, with horses in general. Uh, I grew up riding from a very early age uh, on a farm. Uh, my parents are farmers. So, Horses have been a part of my life well, well before I became a professional jockey. So I do seemingly have an intimate relationship with, with, with the horses and, you know, they're very, very sensitive creatures and, you know, I love working with them and, you know, quite often we're not on the horses for that long before we, the gates open and you're in a race. So, you know, some horses can be more difficult than others, but, you know, you, you just treat them with respect and, and allow them to be be themselves and, and try and work with their little idiosyncrasies, I guess. And I mean, at the end of the day, it's a process. And, you know, I just try and, you know, keep it simple, really, if I had to be honest, AP. Our guest on the Everest Connections is Hugh Bowman, world-class jockey, 2017 Long Jeans, world's best jockey. At your level, you oftentimes have a pick of several horses for any given race, I'm going to give you a hypothetical. You've got a horse with, to use a, a great Australian term, I believe, a stack of ability that's as high as the Eiffel Tower, but is a difficult horse. You don't necessarily get along too well. It's a, a difficult ride. You've got another horse that has pretty good ability, uh, but you really love riding that horse. How do you decide you know, which one to, to get in there? Well, it is, you were right. It is a very hypothetical question, but I, I find, you know, unless you've got an, an extremely sort of outstanding individual uh, as far as the horse's ability goes. I, I found that 
it's better to work with the people you're working with. So you mentioned Chris Waller, another trainer I ride for a lot is James Cummings, who headlines the, he's a head trainer of Godolphin here, here in Australia. So, you know, they'd be the two biggest stables here in Sydney. So I find that um, I, I, I find myself working more with the, with or for the trainers rather than a particular horse. And the thing about horses, they, they, they'll come and they'll go and the people will stay around. So, you know, that the, there's owners that I ride for as well, um, not contracted to anybody. So I'm ultimately a freelance rider. So the decisions are, the decisions are my own ultimately, uh, which is a little bit different to say what you might have in, in the, in Europe. I'm not, so familiar with the right. arrangements in the United States, but here in Australia, that there's no there's no jockey that's on a retainer. Um, it, it has been the case before; there has been retainers, but for me personally, it's, it just hasn't been the road I've wanted to take uh, for that very reason, so that I can make my own decisions. But like I said, AP, that the people in the industry do remain, and so it's those relationships that that are important in my opinion to, to be nurtured and you, you just think, hope that those people get the right horse. I think you're so right. I mean, we, we love horses and the horse racing industry, but life is about people and those relationships and, and nurturing those. Let's talk about a choice you've made as that independent contractor to get in the irons aboard lost and running for the Everest. What were some of the factors that led you to accept that assignment? Well, he, he's a he's a progressive horse who I've had a lot to do with. Uh, obviously, I rode him in the Everest last year, and he he's a horse with extreme ability. Uh, he would have to race. He'd have to reach a personal best to win the Everest, but I, I think that's achievable. I really do think that he's a horse on the way up, and win, lose, or draw, he's going to be very competitive for the race. Uh, he's proven that he he ran well in it last year after, you know, a disappointing start to his preparation. So if things can go more smoothly for this horse early in the prep, you know, I'm sure he can run a better race than last year. Whether or not that's good enough to win, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, I think he's a right horse for the, for the race. Hugh, you've won 100 Group 1 races. You know what you're doing. As you went back and studied the film and thought about it and talked to people, give me a personal grade on your performance last year aboard Lost and Running, and what possibly could you do hypothetically or even specifically better in 2022? Uh, well, last year the race went very smoothly for us, so I was really pleased with that. Um, the horse ran uh, to expectation. We expected a forward running from him, a forward showing, and, and he delivered on all accounts, so really proud of him. But a lot of that came to do with a smooth running transit, you know, it's a high pressure, twelve hundred meter race. Things happen quickly, but you've got to be, you've got to have the sense of mind to not try and rush the horses either. Despite the fact that it's high pressure, high stakes, uh, short course. Um, but Randwick is a very fair track from the twelve hundred meter start, and you know, with an expected high pre high presence of pace and pressure up front, that style suits his horse because he does like to sit back off off a good speed, particularly over six furlongs, which is the distance of the Everest. And uh, yeah, like I said, I, I, a smooth running transit is what, what, what the key is. Hall of Fame jockey Hugh Bowman, our guest on the Everest Connections. In my research, the word patience kept coming up when people would describe you. And I know that Australia is known for its sprinters and the Everest is a sprint. How do you mesh those two ideas? You just mentioned that, that you still need to be patient, but you also mentioned, of course, it's a short race how do you decide when to put it into fifth gear and just go for broke? Well, you've got to ride your horse to its strengths. So if you're on a front running horse that likes to run along like nature strip, for instance, uh, amazing athlete, currently the best sprinter in the world that was proven with his recent success at Royal Ascot. Uh, so a horse like him is going to be ridden differently to a horse like lost and running. Uh, but for lost and running, to be competitive against Nature Strip, it's important that, you know, I, I try and stay within three or four lengths of that horse. But it's important that Lost and Running's comfortable at his own pace as well. So it's if I try and go the speed of Nature Strip, 
uh, lost and running will not run to his best. So, you know, you've got to play to your horse's strengths. And ultimately, for me as a rider, I mean, you know, I want to win more than as much, if not more than everybody else. But, you know, I, my, my job is to get my horse to run to, to its peak, run the best race it can. And if that, if I can do that, then, you know, that's my job done and hopefully that comes out with a with a winning result but if not we've got to accept that the horse maybe you know whether it's the Everest or the Melbourne Cup or any race you know you can only ride the horse to run as well as it can run and you make a great point I mean if if you're out there against a bunch of Buicks uh it's not as as difficult as if you're out there against a bunch of Porsches and Ferraris and all you can do is is steer your equine to the best of its abilities Exactly right. And, you know, ride the horse to run, run, run as well as it can possibly run. Hugh, when the Everest was first announced about a half decade ago, a novel idea, a different type of race. Uh, some people thought it was a carnival barker uh, type situation here and gone. It's obviously had some staying power. What were your thoughts about the race then? And have they changed at all in the last five or six years? Uh, my thoughts have changed. This is this is one of the premium horse racing events on the planet. It's got attention globally. And like you said, it's only five or six years old. So I've ridden in four Everests and I, I made the choice. Uh, one year I didn't ride there, which was uh, I went to ride in the Caulfield Cup and ultimately ran second in the Caulfield Cup. So uh, the Everest is where it's at. And, you know, the, the, the vibe around it, obviously the first year it was very, uh, it was a very surreal feeling. No one really knew what to expect, but I can assure you when I got to the races on Everest Day, when it was first run, the feeling and the excitement and the vibe of the crowd was something that I've never experienced uh, prior to. And the only time I do experience that that type of adrenaline is when the Everest is being run. So... It's really quite special. That's a strong statement, folks, for, again, a guy who's a Hall of Famer, World Jockey of the Year five years ago, 100 Group 1 victories. He's got a bunch of trophies and a bunch of experiences. And you just, you just heard right there the uniqueness of the Everest. I want to ask you to, to recreate in your mind's eye, if you will, another unique experience. Because when, when we talk about race car drivers, that's, that's dangerous. They go a lot faster than you guys do, but there's no brain in a race car. You, you can turn that baby off and it's going to stop. You've got a huge animal with four legs and a very small cerebral cortex up there. What's been the most frightening experience you've had as a professional? Uh, probably in the barriers. I, uh, it was many years ago now, but I had a horse that uh, read, read over backwards in the barriers and I, I went out the back but my feet got caught on the gates. So I was hanging out and the horse turned around and was striking. I was lucky not to get hurt uh, on that occasion, but that was frightening. But, you know, whenever you have a race fall, it's it's not a great feeling. And it, it's something that's inevitable, I guess, and not something that we as jockeys think about on a daily basis. But I, I'm sure you can't. It's because... pretty frightening when you're halfway to the ground and, yeah. You forget just how quickly you, you forget just how quick you're going um, yeah. a, until you get to that stage. It, it's it, another cliche, but it's true. You guys pound for pound. I think the bravest athletes in the world, I have the honor each American summer in, in August and September to go to the state of Wyoming and be the track announcer, low level professional thoroughbred and quarter horse racing. And it's a short track. These guys are, are often at a very early stage in their careers. and They're just experiencing some of the things that you've gone through can you paint a picture for the common man, the common woman of the nerves it takes to do what you men and women do in the sport of Kings getting on these animals? Well, I mean, really, unless something goes wrong, it's very safe, but there are instances where there's, you know, it's no fault of any, any human error. There are instances where, where mistakes are made by, by jockeys or, or other, other, facets that may cause an accident but ultimately you know you could have an accident driving a car too so I mean the risks are obviously much higher and if you do fall there's really not a lot of protection there they've got a vest we've got a skull cap of course but you know the reality is that when you do fall you're going to get hurt and um, it's an unfortunate 
uh, part of you know that what what we do as as jockeys as athletes, uh, but we're all very aware of it. And I think in the time that I've been riding, uh, safety measures both on and off the horses, um, the, the thoroughness of the way thoroughbreds are vetted and looked at and and prepared has increased as like any sport, like any business, progress has to be made. And, and I believe it has significantly, significantly in the last 20 years. He's Hugh Bowman, world-renowned jockey. I'm AP Herald. This is the Everest Connections. And I want to get back to another uh, a part of jockeying in basketball, which is one of my favorite sports, it's renowned for trash talking, you know, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or three-on-three -three or five-on-five. -five. When you're in that gate with 10 or 12 other guys, how much, you can see it, how much- He's uh, paid. Uh, Excuse me, sorry. No worries. How much verbal jockeying, as it were, do you guys engage in, or is it pretty tight-lipped and you're just locked in? Um, look, there's a bit of verbal, um, bit of verbal when you get back into the jockey's room but in races i mean the concentration is um extreme uh everyone's concentrating everyone's focused and you know it's really just you and your horse out there and you got to as much as you're working against your competitors you got to work with them as well because that's just the way it is to get the best result a little bit like the cycling i love watching the cycling in europe you know even though they they work you know they have teams of course but generally speaking you know, that if you get a breakaway pack, you've got to work with the guys that may not necessarily be on your team to get the best results. So it's to a similar extent, racing can be the same at times. So you've got to work with your fellow riders. But, yeah, there's certainly plenty of plenty of chit-chat um, after a race, particularly if there's an incident, uh, if something happens. So it, that, that's a good part of the sport, though. Really good. Absolutely. How much do you feed off the energy at, at the Everest? The fans are going nuts. It's it's the Sydney Spring Carnival. How much does that get you stoked to perform at your best? Yeah, I mean, look, you don't need any encouragement when you're racing for that sort of stakes and, and that sort of uh, a race like the Everest. So, I mean, you're pretty, to be honest, you're pretty up and about anyway. But what I've noticed about the Everest, and I mentioned it before, that I've never never felt any experience like crowd vibe quite like it the very young crowd it's a, it, it's you know and you talk about basketball you know basketball is a sport that is attracted to young people it's a fast sport uh things happen quickly points are scored regularly uh there's always things happening and i myself you know i'm a sports lover whether it be you know rugby league here in australia or the basketball in the u.s um you know but uh Sports with high turnover creates attention, particularly with the younger group of people, and that's exactly what the Everest does. It gets the young people there, it gets them interested, and they're not they're, they're not just there for the party; they're there for the race, and they and they they know about it. And I've noticed that that brings the younger people out, sort of leading up to it as well. So it's it's just been a fantastic um, initiative, and it's a great to be a part of it every year. Hugh, you've been racing professionally since the late 20th century. You're no spring chicken, but you've still got some some mounts left in, in, in your career. What has changed for the better and what has changed for the worse in your time in professional horse racing? Uh, well, I think what I touched on before about the safety aspects of, you know, horses and jockeys, I think the, the measures that have been put in place over the last 20 years to make improvements in these areas of it's been fantastic. Uh, horse welfare, uh, jockey welfare, you know, participants. Uh, it, I, I just think there's more of an understanding of what needs to be done. And as in any business, as I said, but, um, <laughs> but what a negative, I think that I could think about it is the, you know, the ability of social media to, to express um, people's opinions. I think that can have a real, you know, it can have a huge positive uh, aspect to it, but also a huge negative side as well. And I just think that that's one thing that could maybe be addressed. Um, just the 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 ability of social media to 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 say the wrong thing and you know be negative. Um, yeah, can can affect people. Let's talk about someone who never knew about social media and was a total positive. His life was way too short your namesake, your great uncle, James Hugh Bowman. 
He was killed in action at the Pacific Theater of World War II. How often do you think about him and what would he think about your successes? Well, I, I never met James Hugh Bowman, obviously. Uh, he was killed well before I was brought into the world. But I, but I do think about my grandfather, his brother, and he never saw me ride in a race, but he obviously had a lot to do with me when I was a child growing up on the farm and he, he would have seen me ride and, and ride with success at Pony Club and Polo Cross and different things that I did as a child. But yeah, I think it would have been really good for my grandfather to see me. And my, my dad often says, um, you know, I really wish my grandfather had seen me race. But then the other side of that coin is that, you know, I, I get great satisfaction out of my parents being able to, you know, follow my career and the the success that I've been able to reach and some of the horses I've been able to ride. Like, it's just been, you know, I have to pinch myself at times. So, yeah, I'm very thankful that they've had the opportunity along with my sister and my wife and now my kids, as, as you just saw one of them. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I mean... Are, are, are getting a chance to experience it as well. So, you know, instead of thinking about negative aspects of who hasn't seen it, I'd like to, you know, look on the other side of the coin and appreciate who has seen it. Absolutely. And, and you're obviously a family man. We just saw one of your kids. How do you balance family time and family life and those commitments with the crazy professional obligations, travel schedule, and a risky career physically? Well, I, I don't really, to be honest. I, I've got a great wife. Uh, Christine, who is Irish herself, she's um, come through the, she was a jockey in the early days back in Ireland and moved over here, but we've been together for 20 years or so, and we've got two kids, Bambi, who's about to turn nine, and Paige, who just popped her head on the screen, she's just turned seven, so um, really it's, it, there's re there's no balance, there really isn't, I mean, it's a high, uh, the, the industry is demanding. It takes, and to be at the level we're, that we're at, it takes um, presence and dedication and you've got to be involved. So, um, yeah, it, it's very important that Christine, um, you know, I'm very lucky to have such a supportive wife and someone who really understands what it takes. And finally, Hugh, if there's a young person out there who's – a competitor and an athlete, but perhaps they're not going to be six foot 10 to play basketball. Perhaps they're not going to be 300 pounds to play rugby or American football. They're more of a jockey sized athlete. What would you tell them about the pros and cons of chasing that dream? Well, it's hard work, you know, and if you want to be successful, um, you know, you can't make success happen. All you can do is turn up and, and do your bit and be the best you can be. But, you know, to, to make a goal, but it takes takes a lot of early mornings, a lot of long days, and you know a a high level high level level of discipline over a long period of time and consistency. So yeah, my advice would be uh, if you if you make the choice, it, it is a lifestyle. It's not a job, and you have to you know you have to ride the waves of the the good times and the bad because it's not all. It's not all beer and Skittles. A man who has ridden those waves and ridden them tremendously well, 100, that's 10 times 10, triple digits, Group 1 victories, 2017, Longines, world's best jockey. You can arguably say the only thing he didn't have in his, in his bag is an Everest victory. We'll see if that changes come October. A distinct honor. Hugh Bowman, thank you so much for joining us on the Everest Connections. You're very welcome. Th thanks for having me on the show.